Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter, along with Sarah. Hi. And we had a little uh, last minute um, technical difficulty, but I think we've managed to start on time or pretty close to it. Um, so if uh, let us know if you have trouble hearing either of us, if we have any microphone issues. Um, I had to put Sarah on the desktop, which is on the other side of the office, because my secondary la laptop finally bit the dust after <laughs> after probably a few extra years of use that it really wanted to give. So um, we're making do with what we have today. <laughs> Uh, if you guys have any questions, make sure you type the word question in the chat in all caps, and that way Sarah can see it and she can relay them to me. And um, otherwise, we're just going to go along. You know, the videos. This is what's. Oh, oh, here we go. Caught on. Got it. Oh, Yay. yeah. There's a delay. Okay. A thirty second delay. Okay. Yeah. We're we're both really out of practice this week, so please <laughs> bear with us. <laughs> but hopefully, the microphones will sound good and everything will be fine. Um, I did put the. Uh, just point kind of generic um, the the products that I'm using in the video description, but I haven't even had a chance to pick out colors. So we're gonna do this together. And then I actually grabbed my colored pencils because I thought that I might want to do some like highlighting on the glass, and I just didn't want to have to reserve whites for like such a like a soft glow there. I thought that would be easier to do in colored pencils. And then we can just kind of have have a really fun kind of get back into the swing of things type of project today. So we're going to start off by wetting all of the paper, and I'm choosing this uh, number 30 uh, Mimic Creative Mark Round. You can use whatever you want, and I get a lot of questions about what pencils I use to sketch, um, because people say whatever they have, whatever they use, typically smudges, and I have to be honest, I like a smudgy pencil, I like a soft pencil, and mine does smudge a little bit when I put water over it, but I find that it doesn't really, it doesn't really show up or, or is too noticeable, so... Um, so, you know, if you want a harder pencil, it's not going to smudge. Look for a, um, an H, a pencil with an H before the number, or even an F before the number. Those are going to be your really hard pencils. All right. Now it's going to, it's taking me quite a lot of water. This paper is very absorbent. This is a Fabriano Artistico. And I hope it doesn't give me a hard time. It is an older sheet of paper and it's absorbing like crazy. So hopefully we don't have any, um, artistic dif difficulties to go with our technical difficulties today. All right, I think I want to do some spattering in the background because I think that'll be kind of a nice way to get some some color in here. I'm using a um, kind of like a rose, like a quinacridone rose type of color. Just want to get some all over color. I want to put some in the drink itself. I'm going to get some of this. Um, permanent green light get a little bit of that lime up there this is going to be just a fun piece here I don't I want to have something in the background that's why I taped it off on all sides I think I'm also going to grab a little bit of ultramarine give it a little bit of sky like maybe you're sitting on the deck and you're you got your beverage And this paper is um, actually a soft press. The only company I know that makes a soft press is Fabriano Artistico. And it's kind of in between a cold press and a, um, a hot press paper. It's got a slightly textured, smooth um, surface. It'd be really nice for colored pencil. That's why I grabbed my colored pencils as well. And you'll notice your color, even though it is a smooth paper, this um, cotton is very absorbent and it's not letting my colors run too much. So I am able to go, even on this, bat, this dark background, and kind of control where my paint um, ends up where I'm painting it. That also has to do with the fact that Fabriano does not use a gelatin sizing, it uses a synthetic sizing. And I do find that it's not as... Um, it's not as much of a barrier to the paper as like the gelatin sizing in the arches paper, arches and other papers that use a gelatin. I'm just getting a little bit of subtle color in there. Chat's quiet today, it seems like. Oh, they're chatting, but uh, no no questions or questions yet. Yeah. People are getting caught up because we missed a week. Yeah. Oh. 
Yeah, it's weird. It's weird being back in the swing of things. I think I want to suggest a little bit of a like a tablecloth here. And I like the um, you know red and white checker tablecloth. So I think I'm actually going to take two different reds. The red I spattered plus this warmer red that's next door. And just kind of... Actually, I'm going to switch to a flat brush because that will just be naturally an easier brush to, uh, to use. And just make myself a little bit of a checkerboard. And I'm going to let my bristles spread apart a little bit and then it'll give me a little bit of a woven texture. I'm just going around the glass. We can always put some more in if we need to. This is such an easy um, tutorial we're going to do today. We're just going to keep it very loose and fun. And see, that's just dry brushing, and it gives you that impression of having that checker checker tablecloth. And I thought that's very summery. When you think of, um, you know, sitting outside, you get a, you know, checker tablecloth on the picnic table. You're just hanging out with friends. I just really kind of like that, um, that motif. And then with a smaller brush, I'm going to go ahead and paint the... I'm going to actually dry this real quick, then we're going to paint the stripes on the straw. So if anybody has any questions while I'm drying, it would be a great time to ask, ask them. I feel like I'm tripping over my tongue today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Pam Butler, what is the name of the book you have recommended in the past for watercolor? Everything you ever wanted to know about watercolor, and I believe it's by Mary Appeloff. And it's I think it's out of print, but you can find it sometimes on eBay or Amazon. Jennifer Hopping, have you ever mounted your watercolors on wood using a wax seal or finish? Does the wax protect or hurt the painting? Well, I think the best way to, if you really want to protect the painting, is to frame it and mat it under glass. But um, I have not. I did buy some of the Dorland's wax to try this, but I haven't done it yet. I have waxed um, paintings that I've done on, like, um, with using the watercolor ground. I painted, like, tin cans with the watercolor ground and watercolored on it and then waxed it. Um, and that was fine for protecting it, but it's not a fine art piece either. That's more of a craft. But um, my friend Angela Fair has a wonderful tutorial on exactly how she does that. She does that for some of her smaller paintings. Um, and I would say I would trust her judgment. If she's doing that for, for her paintings, um, then it's probably fine. Grace Anna Shack, Art Shack 1. What kind of watercolor journals for my teaching classes? Um, well, if you're getting them for students and you want a journal, the Canson Mixed Media XL is a very robust paper and very inexpensive. So students can experiment without worrying about, um, you know, wasting paper. Uh, that's a good one. They also, the Strathmore Visual Journals are really good and they're very inexpensive. I'm going into that uh, rosy crimson color that we used at the beginning for our spattering. And I'm going to just go and paint the stripes on the straw. Just make sure your hands are dry if you're going to rest them on your dry paper so you don't end up uh, transferring any moisture. Now, the so soft press paper um, would probably be very useful to somebody that wants a little bit more control in their work if they feel like the watercolor um, is a little unwieldy. I feel that the soft press just kind of, um, it just kind of grabs everything and lets it, kind of stay where you put it a little bit more. So if you're doing like a botanical or something where you just want a little more control, it would be a nice option. You know what? My paper, my paper is still damp. I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to dry it some more. I can, I could feel it because I had to put so much water on it. I think it absorbed a lot more than I expected. I, and I see a little feathering there. So it just shows me there's probably still some moisture in there. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. But I was using the Strathmore Visual 140-pound uh, cold-pressed journal. 
uh, during vacation and um, it's got a bit of a texture but not a crazy amount it's a nice all-purpose paper and it's very inexpensive I know here in the States we pay at like AC more about five five fifty for a five by seven journal and about ten for a nine by twelve I think So I actually have a watermelon smoothie recipe if anybody would like to try something if you have leftover watermelon. We did this the other day. I didn't have room to put it in the fridge. So I cut it up and threw it in a uh, bag in the freezer. And then the next day I just threw it in the blender with uh, some lemon-lime drink mix. And it made a really refreshing, light, low-calorie um, smoothie. So it's something you can do with leftover watermelon. And it looks just like this. So um, <clears throat> I thought that was really pretty and would be fun for a summertime painting. And that way you don't waste your watermelon, because if you leave it out at room temperature, it kind of gets yucky. I don't eat watermelon. You don't eat watermelon? No, I don't like it. Oh. I like it, but I haven't had many good ones this year. The, the best one I had was from Sam's Club, but the other ones have been kind of blah. And this one had seeds in it, and the kids were very disappointed with the uh, seeded watermelon. They said, we prefer boneless watermelon. Boneless watermelon. Kids today, but too easy. No seeds in their fruit. You can go ahead and uh, actually just very lightly graze the side of the straw with your paint, and that will help kind of complete it. This is a pretty bright scene. You wouldn't have too much of a shadow on there, so this just makes it a little bit easier to uh, to deal with. Now, once you get to the glass area, you don't want to continue painting the straw in the same way because the glass is going to distort it a little bit. Um, I also want to let you know that when the smoother your paper, the more it's going to buckle. Like you can probably see here, I've got a little bit of a buckling going on in here. Um, the rougher your paper is, the less buckling you're going to experience. I think that texture, the texture to it does, um, does something to keep it a little bit more um, flat and then I'm going to just add a little water to my brush and I am just going to very loosely kind of continue the straw in there a little bit so it's kind of distorted a little bit with the, with the glass and then I can take a little bit of this color just really watered down and I can um, go right under the rim in the back because it would be kind of reflecting some of that color this color from the straw as well as the color from the uh, drink we're going to put in there. All right. And now let's grab some lemon yellow. And we're going to go all over this lime here. I'm not sure if it's a lemon or a lime. We're going to kind of get this blocked in. Don't worry if you have some other colors on top of it. It's not a big deal. And this, I'm not painting. We've got the, the drink line there because the drink is semi-opaque with that, the watermelon-y color. So I'm leaving that unpainted, just kind of going right up to the edge. And then I'm going to grab a little of this uh, kind of emeraldy green here. It's PG36, so that would be your phthalo green. Mix up a little lemon yellow. And I'm going to do the rind. But when I get the edge there of the glass, I'm just going to skip a little space so that you get that little reflection. And I think I'm going to blend that out with a little bit of the yellow kind of on its own because that green's pretty strong. Rebecca Corvo, I know you use the white unit ball gel pen for highlights. Do you use any other color in your watercolor paintings? Uh, does she like opaque color, maybe? She doesn't say. Um, 
Or maybe she means, oh, she probably means any other gel pen colors. No, not really. I mean, you can if you want to, but I, I just kind of grabbed that kind of as a last minute kind of highlight situation. And that one just happens to be really opaque. I, I really kind of advise against um, having more than a couple gel pens going at once. So if you had like a whole set of gel pens and you're only using it for an accent on your watercolor, I think it would dry out. They'd dry out before you ever really got a chance to use them. So I would recommend, you know, just get a, just the white. Or if you do find a couple of colors useful, just get those couple of colors and, um, and use them up before you replace them because they don't, they won't last um very long i'm gonna mix those two reds together with some water to make my smoothie color and um i am just going to kind of paint this in i'm gonna avoid there's a couple little mint leaves that i sketched in and i'm gonna just kind of go around because they're pressed up against the glass so i'm just going right up to that um beverage water line kind of area. And there's some other fruit in there, but it's kind of back a little ways, so I don't want that to be like really striking. Yvette Cazares, what watercolor do you prefer for starters? Um, I would recommend the Daniel Smith Essential Set. It's six tubes. Um, it ranges between like $25 and $32 on Amazon. Uh, but it's got your six basic colors, which would be a warm and a cool version of each primary. And um, I find that to be a great way to start. And then also I would add in burnt sienna, yellow ochre, and sap green for convenience. And those are, that's really all you need to get going and starting with a limited palette will make you better at mixing your colors and um and just overall give you a a better start than having a big confusing palette with more colors and you know what to do with and then you could also afford to buy nicer colors you know because you're you don't have to buy so many grace anna shack art shack one how do i get better at the shadows of my watercolor painting i struggle with that um, I would say practice like maybe set some still lifes up in your home and you know throw a lamp next to it and so you have a nice strong light and then just try practicing painting what you see. Um, that's gonna be the best way to teach you kind of shadows and highlights because um, because you'll have actually something to go by that you can actually get up close to and look at if you need to as opposed to a photograph where um, you're not seeing it in real life you're only seeing like a you know an impression of it. I had a block that it was way too dark. And we'll be bringing back some of the uh, highlights with colored pencils in a bit, so I'm not too worried about um, messing any of that up. Now, the glass itself has a light blue cast to it, and you see it a lot more on the bottom where it's solid glass, and you just see like a little bit of a hint of it at the top, and that's our ultramarine color. I think I might actually mix a smidgen of um, like thalo blue to it. I think that's thalo. This one's probably thalo. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to mix a little bit of that thalo blue in there because it's not quite a pure ultramarine. It's got a little bit of a green to it. Spiritual Seeker, is gessoed surface suitable for watercolors? No, you need a, um, well, you could use, uh, they make a watercolor ground, which is kind of like a gesso for watercolors. That would be a much better choice than the, um, than just regular gesso, because regular gesso is, is not as porous, and the watercolor would kind of beat up on it, and if you ever got that wet, the watercolor would come right off. So here, I'm leaving gaps where the highlights would be because that I do want to be kind of crisp, the darker, the, I want to be brighter than what a gel pen, um, I'm sorry, than what a colored pencil would be. Uh, Mary shows, I have seen some people use neutral tint. Do you use it and what is it for? Um, it's a gray. I don't use it, but um, I, you see it a lot more often in like oil painting. <clears throat> it's supposed to be kind of like a neutral gray. I, I personally don't find much use for it, but 
Um, but you can always try it and see if it's useful for your method of painting. Sometimes people will do like an underpainting with that and then glaze over it with other colors. That's something you could certainly try. Of course, that'd be a little bit easier to do in acrylics or oils um, because the under layers wouldn't lift. But um, Or you could use it to kind of tone down your colors if you find that your colors are just way too vivid. So here I'm just, I need to add a little more water to that, but I am just... Um, going in and just tinting the glass in the top part of the cup a little bit. Vapor Eon Fanatic 1234, what do you think of the Senlier student line? I just got a set of 12. I think it's fantastic. I have the set of 24 and I I, I put it side by side with my Senlier um, professional colors and they really held up well and I found the working property properties to be very similar so and I think that's really nice because if you decide to, that you really love the paint and you branch out of the professional line you're gonna be um, you're gonna be very comfortable with how those professional paints work um, you know compared to the um, the student grade ones they, it, they're fantastic they're, they remind me an awful lot of the Van Gogh paints uh, Rembrandt has the Van Gogh line as their student line and they're also a fantastic uh, line of paints and it really gets a student ready for higher quality like the higher quality paints when they're ready to branch out So I think it's a, a fantastic line All right now I'm also going to add some um, well, I think I'll let that dry. I'm going to add colors on the blueberries and the lime there Dominique designs I honestly can't remember have you ever used ink tents with watercolor? Yes, I have. I've used ink tents kind of as the um, as the first layer, and then I've glazed over with watercolor because the ink tents won't move once you've um, once you put the watercolor on it. So you can glaze over with watercolor without removing any of the uh, the ink tents. I should get those out again. I really enjoy those. Don Snyder, how do the other Eastern watercolors like Marie's and Yasutoma compare to the Gonzai tam Tambi? Well, they're so they they tend to a lot of the other ones like the Marie's. Um, if you let them dry out in the palette, they tend to crack on you. So that's kind of a bummer. If you like to work from dry paint, it's it's not as hard. And Gansai, I believe, means hard, and Tambi may mean watercolor or something like that. I know one of the words. In that uh, that paint means like a hard color, and I think they they also don't seem to have that um, like the Genza Tambay almost has have like a little bit of a sheen to them. If you put uh, put them in thicker passages on your paper, it's like it's got a, like a little shellac in it or something. And the other Eastern watercolors tend to be a lot more matte, so that would be the biggest difference I'd say. And I'm taking ultramarine blue, and I'm going to grab a little of that rose color. And make a violet for the blueberries. Pascalito, why do we use yellow ochre so often when it is usually an opaque color? Wouldn't it be better to mix a transparent yellow? Well, if you use the PY uh, 42 yellow ochre, that is more transparent than the because it's a synthetic versus the iron um, yellow ochre. Uh, it is such a nice tempering color and you're usually not using it really thickly so it doesn't really come out opaque. It granulates so it gives you a nice texture with the other colors. Um, and it can also help transition colors and tone them down so they're not so bold. I'm going to grab a little bit of um, this uh, green and I'm going to grab a little more ultramarine and make myself kind of like a I want to make some of these blueberries look a little less ripe and just give a little bit of that color in for a little difference in interest. Uh, Sig fam, when you're choosing what size to make your painting, do you choose based on framing size? What size do you paint most often? Um, that's a really smart way to choose what size you're going to paint because uh, framing costs can, you know, triple if you're not working in a standard size. And, you know, you if you don't know how to do it yourself you can at least buy off the rack that's going to work with your um with your project so that's a really that's a really smart thing to do and a lot of your um your paper pads are going to come in like a standard frame or a standard size you can frame so uh so yeah but generally i i go by what i feel like painting 
more than how easy it's going to be to frame. But I think it's smarter to go by what's easier to frame, you know, as long as you can find something that you can uh, express yourself, the idea that you want to get across in the, in the size that, uh, that will be easier to frame. Michael Ann, can Neo Color 2s be used like a pastel pencil over a watercolor painting? Yes. And they can also be re uh, soluble. The only thing you notice about this the soft press paper is it does not want to lift. So I do kind of have to be aware that if I decide I want to go and lighten the color, it's not going to lighten so much when I lift it. It's definitely absorbing the pigment a little bit more. And that, I don't know if that's the uh, the soft press sizing because Fabriano is the only company that makes it, or if it's the fact that Fabriano does not use a gelatin size. It could be a, a combination of both. And now I'm going to take some of this green because it's the one I would have used sap green except I've already been using this green so I'm just going to keep sticking with it because otherwise I'd be introducing a new color and I'm going to mix it with some of the yellow I've been using and get my little mint leaves I'm going to grab a little bit of the phthalo blue and add to that mix so I can darken it. And put some of that in there too. And we will tone that down a bit, but I just need to get that color in there for the time being. And I can go around and add that anywhere else I want. And I think I want to maybe carry on that tablecloth, but since I can't really get a flat brush in there, I'm just going to go in with this round brush and just kind of extend my little design here. And then I can take some of this color and add some to the bottom of this glass because now the glass is dry. And you want to keep your lines kind of streaky and hard because these are reflections, so they're going to be very crisp. It's a reflections on a very shiny object. <clears throat> now I do want to get the hint of some of these uh, some fruits in the um, in the drink there I have to be careful because green is the opposite of red so when I paint that red on top it might just go kind of like black or um, or kind of gray so what I think I might do is just kind of grab some of that yellow and see if I can go yellow on there just to kind of maybe give it the hint of maybe some lemon That works all right, I think. Just tints it a little bit. It's nothing too strong, but it does give you um, the impression of something in the back there. And then very gently going to drag a little bit of this red color over the mint leaves there. Okay. Now something we could do, because this is really transparent and this definitely has an opaque cast to it, is we could take make use of our Chinese white watercolor, because I get that question all the time, why is there white in all of our watercolor sets? So why don't we put it to use today? And so one thing I could do is mix it in with the color I already have, or I could actually go right on top of what I have here. Um, I think I'm going to mix it in. And what this does, it's it, Chinese white is not a very opaque watercolor. It's more of like a tempering color that um, softens and helps you transition other colors. So it can um, it can be a nice way for getting like a streaky area to be able to kind of mellow it out. It's not going to be a, like a bleed proof white. It's not going to be an opaque white. It's definitely more of like a 
like an altering white. And I don't use it very often, but I think in this case, it's actually going to improve the painting. And I think if the product is going to improve the painting, then go ahead and use it. So I do want a little bit of a texture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in this lightest edge of the glass and I'm going to tap. And you can see it's not very opaque. It's not, um, it's not really light. It's not doing a lot. Let me try it on its own. We'll see what we get. And as it dries, it does get a little more transparent. I think it looks a little bit whiter at first because we're getting a reflection off the wet paint. But I want to get the, um, the texture of the pulpiness in the smoothie. So I'm tapping it. Now we can streak on some colors after to give the glass the crispness and the hardness that um, that it would have. You're throwing a few of the regulars for a loop because you're using white. I know, I know. People are shocked and surprised. That's all right. If I use that up, then I could put another color in that well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is. I know this is going to be a mixed media anyway. That's why I grabbed my uh, my watercolor pencils because I know I didn't want to use masking fluid, and uh, for some of those sharp highlights, that would really be the uh, more the customary way to do it, but I still feel like doing that today. Actually, I don't like that on top of the mint leaves. Yeah, I use up this so I could put a good color in there. I used to be really fussy about not using white, but I think that if you use it as a tool to improve your painting, especially if you're using mixed media, it can be a really helpful helpful tool. It does take away the luminosity of your painting, but, um, you know, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, Jennifer Hopping, is there a way to make gouache from watercolor? Yes, you can mix a, I would use a, um, a titanium white gouache and I would mix it with your colors and you can um, you can get a gouache. Cause, because like I mentioned, the white watercolor, even though say mix white watercolor with your paint technically makes it a gouache, you're not gonna have the satisfying opacity that you're gonna have if you start off with a white gouache. Um, but I have to say that I it's gonna be cheaper for you just to buy gouache. There's a, um, there's a company called Lucas that makes a student gouache and it's like under 10 bucks at Jerry's Artorama and um, and that's a great one to get started with. It's super opaque and velvety, and um, it's very affordable. You get into like the Windsor Newton Designer gouache, that's really pricey. Like one tube will set you back 15 to 20 bucks. So I would start with like a little set like that and see how you like it. And then if you love it, I would recommend the Schminka or the M. Graham gouache because Schminka and M. Graham have managed to make light fast gouache, which is difficult because when you're mixing a color with white, um, you're diluting all those little pigment particles and gum arabic is the binder and it's not very um, It's not very protective to the watercolor pigment So that's why watercolor generally has a lower light fast rating than other colors uh, Because gum arabic just doesn't protect it as well as like an acrylic or an oil um, So when you have all those the paint particles being dispersed in that white paint they become less protected and less light fast but Schminka and M. Graham have a light fast gouache so um, if you do want to delve into the more expensive stuff, get the stuff that's going to last. And those two brands have really good light fast ratings. All right. I think I actually want to move on to colored pencil now because um, I've got pretty much a, a like color everywhere. And um, I think this is probably as far as I want to take it with a watercolor. And the color pencils that I'm using are the... Um, I'm using these because I've got two at my disposal of every color. These are the Chameleon color tones, and I will add a link after the live show is done. I wasn't intending on using these originally when I put the post up, but I changed my mind. Um, the white is not going to be as opaque as like a Prisma color or a Color Soft, but um, but I think it'll be fine for this because I'm not going over anything too too harsh. And I could still go on watercolor on top of these. There will be some resistance, but. Um, but not enough that I couldn't go on top. So I decided not to do the, not to do more watercolor on top. And then I can use the edge of my pencil and you can see there's not a, there's enough tooth for colored pencil, but it's not so much tooth that I can't go on the side here and shade in, but I kind of want that frosty look on the edge. So 
the color pencil helps me easily achieve that. And I'm going in little circles and I'm pulling in towards the center of my uh, smoothie here. And I'm just letting up on the uh, pressure as I come towards the center. If I decide I want more white, what I want to do is start back out at the side, a little more pressure, and then ease up as I come towards the center. That way I'm getting the more concentration of the frosty light color on the edges. Uh, we have two separate brush questions that tie sure, in. Sure. Sarah Ryan, which brush bristles are best for water painting? And Beth Claybrook, do you have a suggestion regarding the quality set of brushes for a beginner? <clears throat> Okay, the best um, the best set of brushes for watercolor is something that they're soft because you don't want a stiff brush that will damage your paper and absorbent. You want it to be able to hold um, a lot of, of pigment. So these uh, these Zens from Royal Langnickel will hold a lot of pigment. These uh, Mimics from Creative Mark will hold a lot of pigment. Um, these Royal Majestics will hold a moderate amount, but since they don't hold so much water, they're easier for beginners to handle because you're not having a ton of water when you're trying to mix your colors and whatnot. So I'd say for a beginner, go with Royal and Nickel Majestic or Aqualon. They are a synthetic brush that are springier and less absorbent. If you're more experienced, I would say go with a Mimic by Creative Mark, the Mimic uh, Squirrel, which is a fake fur, uh, the Zens by Royal and Nickel, or the Princeton Neptunes. So Zens will be the cheapest, the Neptunes will be the more, more expensive, and the Mimics are in the middle. So you basically soft and absorbent are the qualities you want for your watercolor brush. When you do this uh, little highlight on the rim with your colored pencil, you just want to just you want to you don't want to put a lot of pigment down, but you want to make sure it's accurate. So if you can see your sketch or your lines from when you originally drew it or trace a pattern, just try to go by that. And you can color really firmly if you want a more opaque passage, like I could kind of do up here. Bev Roberts, when you use colored pencils with watercolor, is the painting still light fast? Depends if your colored pencils are light fast. It, and it depends. I mean, there's so many variables because some watercolor, some colors are, some aren't, some brands are. So, you know, even in any brand, you're going to have colors that are light fast and colors that are not. So, you know, it just depends on how you choose your colors. I don't know about these pencils. There was no light fast rating um, from Chameleon. However, they're made by a, uh, a pretty well-renowned color pencil maker because they were private labeled by, that's what a lot of craft companies will have. Art companies make their products because it's cheaper and they know what they're doing. And, you know, craft company is not going to invest research and development money for something that, you know, might be out of fashion in, you know, two years. So they'll just hire out a um like another company to handle that and they are using an austrian pencil maker that's fairly well respected for there so i would bet they're probably pretty good but um i can't say for sure uh, karen dash i think has the best light fast rating of pencils so does faber castell and their polychromos and uh albright drewer watercolor pencil lines i'm, I'm basically repeating what i did over there not to quite as much of an extent but for a bit over here. Uh, Guy Liala, how do your pencil lines blend so neatly with your watercolors? They look practically invisible, and when I use pencil, the pencil taints my watercolors. Hmm. Um, well, I was using the side of my pencil as I transitioned, so I'm using like hard strokes here at the edge. Those, those are watercolor pencils, right? No, these no, are regular. These are wax color pencils. So I'm using a pretty firm stroke here at the edge, but as I come out, I'm switching to a more circular stroke, and I'm going on the edge, so it's just kind of like feathering out those lines. So it's just with the pressure and the method of application. And I'm going to see, hopefully I have a pencil sharpener here. I have moved so many things around. I am so out of sorts. <laughs> like a, I had a computer just decided to crap out on me today. We're lucky we have a show at all. I feel so out of sorts today. Oh, we have some, oh. oh, and we're having technical issues? Nope, <laughs> I'm just going to use my knife because I apparently don't have a pencil sharpener handy. But that's all right. I think you actually waste less if you sharpen with a knife anyway. Yeah, the beauty of a live show can't edit out sharpening a pencil. 
I probably will actually go with a little bit of gel pen too because there's nothing quite uh, there's nothing quite that will match that crispness as a, as a gel pen. Now, if you did end up getting like background color on that white straw, that's a great thing you can do with colored pencils. You can go right over that if you had some feathered colors. Uh, you can go in there. A lot of um, botanical artists like to use colored pencil. They'll sharpen them really sharp, and they will go in and add like the veins of a flower after um, after they're done doing their washes, so they can get more detail. And they can take their time. So, I think you should use the materials that speak to you that you enjoy, and um, and see what's possible with what you have. Don't worry about the rules so much. So I'm doing some white in here because this is very very light if you look it's backlit this lime is backlit and it's almost glowing because the light's being trapped in those little juicy pockets so i'm going in and adding some white and cream i do feel like i want to pump up the color a little bit so i'm going to go with lemon peel here now the cool thing about these pencils is that um you can like if i'm if i'm using this color here and i decide i want a darker color of it i just flip it around and i can go in with its um with its shade color so um i think that's kind of clever this is something that's marketed to the craft market and not the fine art market but i still think you know just the fact that you can have so many colors in such a small space it's um it's pretty useful i'm gonna try to get some rid of some of that red right there from the background with my white And I haven't had any issues with these breaking. I think it's because they're a harder um, material. Now, when I am coloring here, I'm coloring pretty firmly, and I am trying to make my um, strokes kind of radiate out from the center out to the edge so I don't end up with... Uh, so I use the lines to my advantage. I do want to have some structure there and some shape there. Carrie Cuddlepuss, is it possible to build up the Chinese white to get the same effect as the colored pencils? Um, you can up to an extent. I Chinese white is not terribly opaque, so um, if you had a titanium white in your set, some watercolors come with a titanium white, and that would give you a little bit more of an opaque white. You can always you can also use pastel. We've done that before. Use pastel over our watercolors in these classes. I just I just love the adjustment factor of using colored pencil, just being able to sweeten something up here, change something a little bit there, add a shadow. And since these don't take up very much space, they were there what I grabbed. They came with a really neat storage container, but I decided to actually put them in a mason jar because it takes up less, less of a footprint on my desk. And um, even though this, the storage case was really cute and well thought out, it, for me, I just decided that I'd rather have, uh, I'd rather just lay it out like this when I'm using them and just having them sitting up on my desk otherwise. Now, a lot of colored pencil artists, and I'm going to shock you guys again, use black. Now, see, if I do the centers in these little... Um, these little blueberries with this dark violet, they do look pretty, you know, pretty realistic. Um, but if I really want to want to sharpen them up, I can go in with black. And I wouldn't use it on its own, but if you mix it on top of something like this, you can get a little bit of a crisper, um, more in-depth, more in-depth look. But it does kind of look like a dark hole there, so we're going to have to use this elsewhere on the picture, or it's just going to feel like completely out of place. So. That's, I think, the the issue with black where people get hung up. And one of the reasons I don't use it very much is because it does kind of give you that black hole look. So I'm going to show you how to integrate the black in other parts of your picture because you are going to need to do it. So where I put that black there, I'm going to need to blend it in with some other colors. People are, people are really, they're shocked about the black. <laughs> they're worried about you. <laughs> Send help. <laughs> The kids are on summer vacation. Anything could happen. Yeah, that's true. I'm surprised at how quiet they are, actually. Well, Maisie was outside reading when I came. Ah. Uh, and I didn't see any of the other children. 
You know, the boy might still be in bed. <laughs> In bed. It's after one o'clock. I know. They're in summer mode. They're they're up later than I am at night. Lax parenting over here, folks. No, it's called they're old enough to take care of themselves to a certain point. Don't need to be there for them all the time. And then let's see. I wonder if we have any kind of like a sea foamy color. Sometimes blueberries have that pretty kind of almost like a tealy sea foam color on top. I probably will need to mix a couple colors for that. But I just think that's kind of a nice touch, and it's that teal is such a pretty summery color. So I'm going to do that in a couple spots, and then I'm going to go over it with my white, and that should bring. Actually, no, I'll go over it with this light blue, and that will bring out that color a little bit more. Heather, cat lady, do you find the speed at which you paint have any influence on the likelihood it will be overworked, i.e. paint fast to avoid overworking? Um, I suppose it would help, you know, especially if you have a tendency to. I think everybody has their own, um, their own comfort level as far as how fast they work. I think the best way to avoid overworking is to take breaks. If you can walk away for a while you you know you'll come back with fresh eyes and you're less likely to overwork it than if you force yourself to finish it on one go i really like how this blue is adding a lot of crispness to this and so if i wanted to integrate that black over here because there would be some reflections on those blue from those blueberries i'd want to do that um in some of these really dark uh black marks so because i'm trying to preserve that hard shiny area i am using this pencil very stiffly in a very definite direction um if i when i was up here and i just wanted to get that frosty look i would use the edge and little circles because i didn't want to see my pencil mark so uh it's just it just kind of comes with learning how to handle the um the medium a little bit so since i do want to integrate that because i used it you did it once you do it again you repetition is very important when you're working with color in anything in art so it doesn't look like wow look at that black but it does give you that okay we're you know it seems to harmonize a little bit more so there's no bad color there's no bad supply you just need to know how to integrate it so that it makes sense so it doesn't look like oh look at that big black mark in there why is that there you know you want it to you want it to integrate. It's like you're putting seasoning on a on a food, some sort of food. And this blue is a nice one to add uh, detail here and there because the glass is a very subtle blue tint to it. And have fun with it. It's a fun summer project. I like to take the color and add little, little spikes of it in uh, unexpected areas because for one, it does cross pollinate when we go and we add our colors here and there it makes everything work together but it can also electrify colors so if you have a little splash of red next to your green whoops i got that in the sky i didn't mean to do that um it will help your colors kind of glow and seem more vivacious You color generally on glass a little bit darker at the edges because that's where you see that kind of double thickness you're seeing through the edge of the glass. Instead of just through one layer, you kind of see multiple layers there. And I love how colors look on top of white. They, they grab a really nice, because um, these colors are kind of translucent, you get this subtle like glow from them kind of like watercolors but it's just different because you have that waxy kind of layer the semi-opaque layer add a little bit of that here and there and then anything you have around can be reflected in the glass so make sure that you are grabbing colors that you have elsewhere and adding them 
like here in the edge of this, see that line is reflected here. We want to get that in here. And I might have a little more blue over here because I have those blueberries. So I can get a little more blue, even though the, the glass is blue as well. Really no wrong you could do there. You'll find you use way more colors when you're using a dry media like colored pencil than you will using a wet media that you can mix. So, But still try to keep in mind what you're using and use it in a few places so you don't end up getting uh, random colors that have no... Um, that have no anchors. All right. I think since I've done wa the watercolor portion, I'm going to take the tape off and see what it looks like and then figure out what else I need to add to it. So if we have any questions popping in, go ahead and ask away. What do you think it needs, Sarah? Um, I think this is the point where if you keep adding, the only thing maybe <laughs> would be some like splatter, a little splatter. Oh yeah, maybe a little more you splatter. Been splatter in a while. No, I haven't. I do a little splatter, and I'm also feeling like I might need a little shadow on this tablecloth because we do have these little these little ripples. So maybe I'll do some that watercolor. So I'm gonna put these back in my mason jar so I can put my palette back down. What color should I splatter? I don't know. I'm thinking I really like that lime green. Oh, yeah, that would be nice. Pick up the lime a little bit. And then you can always blot any splatters that went too far awry. That brush was a um, was a sword, and it gives you it'll give you a row like a line of stro of uh, splashes. So I'm gonna maybe do a little bit darker green and use a different brush so I get a little bit more controlled splashes. Uh, Dominique Design. Would one side of this drawing need a shadow? Well, it's pretty bright here, so and I don't have any really def definite shadows on anything else, so I think I would leave this one in particular. Um, it would really depend on what how things are shadowed elsewhere, um, but you could easily do that with a little bit of a, a color pencil or something if you wanted to keep it really subtle and work your way up. I am going to do a little bit of shading on the tablecloth, and I like to use a small flat. I think I actually have one. Grace Blosser is voting for glitter. glitter. Glitter? I don't have any glitter up here. All my glitter's downstairs. I'm gonna let's see what colors do I use? I need to make a gray, so I think I'll do my green and red because those two colors should make a nice gray, and their colors I've already used. Oh wait, I don't want that one because I had white in that mix. Or so. embossing powder. Ah, oh, I don't have that up here either, though. <laughs> Sorry, people, no glitter today. Kendall Macaulay, other than the basic colors like ultramarine, which ones would you recommend? Well, the Daniel Smith Essential set has uh, two versions of each primary, and that's what I'd recommend going with. Um, it's like Thalo Blue, Ultramarine, Quinacridone Rose, Cad Red, um, Hansi Yellow Light, which is kind of a lemon color, and... Um, Let's see. Oh, and New Gamboge, which is a warm yellow. All right. So I want to just subtly do some shadows. So I've cleaned my brush off. It's just uh, angled flat. I'm going to get the pointy end of the angle into my paint. And I'm going to start just by giving a little shadow under my, uh, my glass there. I'm just going to bring it out into the fabric. Uh, David H. I got some counterfeit Windsor and Newton the other day. Do you know of anyone that covers counterfeit art products in their videos or websites? Who should I report it to? Oh my gosh. Maybe to Windsor and Newton? Yeah, I guess I'd report it to Windsor and Newton and tell them where you 
where you got it. And where, because I'm curious too. Um, I'm curious where that would happen. And I guess to avoid it would be to order from a reputable art dealer. Uh, There's a reason you don't buy hair products at TJ Maxx because most of them are counterfeit. Really? Yeah, a lot of them, they're either expired or counterfeit, like, especially if there's the bottles that have, like, the plastic wrapper, you know, with the logo and stuff. Yeah. A lot of times you can unzip those, and when you actually peel it off, it's not what they're, <gasps> yeah. Oh, my gosh, mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I never yeah. really saw it. Yep. Oh, that's awful. Yeah, I've never had any issues with, um, with counterfeit, but I've, because, like, when I order on Amazon, usually you can see, I had, the only problem I ever had was something not arriving, and then I went and checked the seller. It wasn't Amazon itself. It was, like, a third party, and they had horrible reviews, but I didn't, I didn't think to check when I just figured it was Amazon, and, uh, and that's the only time I've had any issues, but, like, if I'm ordering, I order from, like, on Amazon, I make sure it's like Society of from all artists or Jackson Czar or Jerry Jadorama or Blick. They all have Amazon presence. If I'm ordering from Amazon, or I just order at like Jerry's or Blick or Cheap Joe's or a place I trust. But that's awful. I'm I'm curious where he or she found counterfeit stuff. That's awful. Uh, Lady Davila, have you tried the Splatter Wonder Speckle Brush that Jerry's has? No, I haven't, but I actually think I have a spatter brush that Rich sent me right there. Maybe we'll get that out, too. See, I'm kind of like he awesome. Got on, at, he got it on eBay. eBay, you oh. You have to be careful on eBay. Yeah, because I've almost ordered stuff. Or, I've almost ordered paint before on eBay. because, And that's that's something that's too bad because there are like reputable reputable people out there selling it. Just like on Etsy, there's, you know, there are suppliers – selling stuff on Etsy and but you never know I guess yeah I mean probably the best that would be Letty Windsor and Newton know yeah I think so, that so they're aware that there are people out there yeah they might have more power to shut them down and maybe they'll even like you know replace it for you even though it's not their responsibility just uh, like as a good <clears throat> good business pra practice they might actually just he says he says that he he thought it might be when he ordered it, but and eBay's taking care of it. Oh, good. So. Okay. Well, there. Yeah, I would just report it to Windsor Newton just so they know. But I'm glad that they're taking care of it. Yeah. So I really like the look of um, watercolor on top of colored pencil, like in layered like this, because like because it. Especially if you have a paper that doesn't have a lot of sizing on it. Maybe you're working on a sketch pad or an art journal and the paper just is not as robust as you would like. It makes a little bit of a barrier. Um, so your paint kind of slides around on top and it's just kind of a fun um, a fun texture. So I can kind of make these squiggly marks and get that texture of the smoothie that I want. And it's a little bit undoable. Like I could go in with a wet brush and kind of wipe some of this off the colored pencil if I wanted to. So, but it seems to be, it seems to adhere enough that I don't really have to worry about it, you know, coming off when I don't want it. It's probably not like, it's it's definitely not like a recommended art, like archival technique because, you know, oil and water doesn't mix, but uh, it's a really fun technique to do. a little shadow on one side of that straw with that mixed gray that I made just want to make sure I'm really really light with it and I'm gonna start the shadow low because I want I'd rather have more paint on my brush a little shadow darker lower than higher yeah that gives it a little bit of roundness all right I can look at it here see what I think I think you're, I think she's done. Yeah, I think if you keep, you're gonna overwork it. I think it's really crooked. <laughs> I'm looking at it's like, hmm, I don't know if it's my camera or, actually, I do think my camera's a little, a little, uh, a little crooked because it seems like one side of my paper is a little bit wider than the other. <laughs> so I think my camera. Oh my gosh, I'm all off today. <laughs> well, that's all right. We're gonna be back on regular schedule now, theoretically. Yes. At yes. Least for a little while. Until yeah. 
until September. I have a wedding. I'll be out of state. Oh, really? Yep. Another wedding. My goodness. I have, yeah, we have. I told. I was in one, and then we have three more weddings this year. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that'll be fun. Yeah, I just get to show up and be a guest. So. Oh, nice. Even better. You don't yeah. have any actual responsibilities other than to get there. That's right. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everyone for uh, checking this out today. Uh, materials list is in the video description, even though it's not very detailed. Just basically tells you what brands of stuff I'm using. Use what you have. I'm sure you've got stuff in your stash that you can do this with. <clears throat> you don't need to have the exact same brand that I'm using here, but um, I will add a, a, a link to these colored pencils in case you do like that dual-ended uh, goodness there. And um, other than that, I guess we'll see you for the next live show next Friday. And um, please leave a thumbs up before you go. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.